by Senate Chamber program signed. Good morning, everyone. You're very welcome to this morning's Committee for the Inf for Infrastructure. Um, we have a quorum. Um, just welcome all members um, via Starleaf and who are here in person. Today we will consider some subordinate legislation and then we will receive a briefing from the Northern Ireland Local Government Association and Solus NI in relation to EU successor funding and a briefing from the Construction Employers Federation on the review of the Planning Act 2011. Um, obviously just advise members who um, are coming through um, remotely um, to ensure that your um, mics are on mute and to raise your hand if you wish to contribute at each agenda item. Um, just advise that we do have to leave this room by, by noon at the very latest, so just if I can just remind you of that and underline that as well. Um, with regards to apologies, I have apologies from um, Mr Hilditch and Mr Buchanan. I don't have any chairs business, uh, so we move then to our draft minutes, which is item three at page six, and that's for the meeting of the 28th of April, if members are content. Okay, thank you. Moving then to item four, which is matters arising. Find that at page 15, again for the meeting of the 28th of April. Do members have any issues arising from the meeting? No, everyone's content. And at page 18, we also have outstanding committee requests for information. And again, as we note each week, there are pieces which are of correspondence which have been outstanding for considerable length of time. And a number of reminders have been sent to those um, who it applies to. Moving then to correspondence at item 5 and the correspondence memo at page 24. You'll see that most pieces of of correspondence are to note, um, with the exception, obviously, of the correspondence which came in then from the Minister, um, relating to issues arising from the committee meeting of the 14th of April. Do members have any comments, or any issues to raise in relation to correspondence? Mr Boylan. Yes, Chair, just in relation to the one at page 71, the resurfacing issue. I mean, there's no, there's, there's, there's no officials there today, is there? So, no. No. Although we have, um, if you recall from last week, we have asked, we have raised the issue, obviously, from the, the front page of the various newspapers, the issue around um, the court case, and then obviously this issue. So we have asked for officials, officials to come in the next number of weeks to discuss procurement and, in particular, um, these types of contracts. No, General. I just want to raise that because that would be a good thing to, to have the officials in to try and understand I mean, what went wrong there and how we progressed that because, as you know, a lot of us are getting calls about rural roads and, and these type of contacts. So if we get the officials in the next couple of weeks, maybe we'll get a proper explanation. But thanks, Chair. Okay. Ms Anderson? Uh, thank you, Chair. Chair, just the, the second point uh, is in response to the concerns uh, that was raised by the taxi sector. And we know that the taxi operators have asked for a meeting uh, with the committee. Now, some of the members have raised the issue about the legal advice uh, due to the letter has been sent uh, by their solicitor. So has there been an update on that? I'll let the clerk. Okay. Um, I have spoken to legal. We're just a awaiting the formal advice um, in writing, which hasn't arrived in time for today, but the steer was that there should really be no issue around it. They are, um, they are asking the committee to use its influence, so they're doing what anybody else would do, but um, it's not sub to say so there shouldn't be any issue, but we should have that formally in writing by next week. Okay, so we can give consideration to that next week if you're content. Um... Yeah, yeah, well, I, th I think if we can back it next week and maybe then we could schedule a meeting with the taxi operators as they have requested. So I'll wait, we'll wait until next week. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else wish to raise any issue with regards to correspondence? Content then to agree um, suggested ac actions as per the, the memo? Okay, thank you. Moving then to item six, which is subordinate legislation, um, not subject to assembly proceedings. 
at page 78. We have SL1, the Road Races Croft Hill Climb Order, Northern Ireland 2021. The proposal is not subject to Assembly proceedings. Are members content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Yes. Okay. Content. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Moving then to item seven, which is SL one, the Dunbar Link and Great Patrick Street Belfast Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland, 2021. It's at page 81. The rule is subject to negative resolution. The rule will abandon two areas of former footpath totalling 253.24 square metres and comprising of an area of 1.4. 147.843 square metres at the junction of Dunbar Link and Great Patrick Street and an area of 105.397 uh, square metres at the junction of Dunbar Link and Exchange Street, Belfast. The abandonment has been requested by the Department of Finance to facilitate the disposal of land. The Department is of the view that this area of road is not necessary and may be abandoned. The bed and soil of the area of road in question is owned by the Department of Finance and following um, the coming into operation of the abandonment order, the area will be disposed of. Are members content with the proposal? Great. Okay, thank you. Moving then to item eight, which is our briefing from the Northern Ireland Local Government Association and SOLAS, and this is in respect of EU successor funding. Hansard will record the meeting. Um, at page 85, you will find the briefing paper and at page 90, the, um, the position paper for SOLAS. So if members are content, we will welcome um, an attending via Starleaf. We have uh, Derek McCallan, who is the Chief Executive of NILGA, Lisa O'Kane, who is the Head of Performance and Partnerships at NILGA, and Dr. Mr John Tully, who is Director of City and Organisational Strategy at Belfast City Council. And can I welcome you all to um, the Infrastructure Committee this morning? And can I first of all apologise? Obviously, um, a couple of weeks ago we were unable to take your briefing, and you very patiently waited. Um, so um, apologies for that. But um, glad to see you here this morning, and look forward to your your presentation. Thanks very much. Um, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, well, um, renewed thanks to the invitation for having us back at the committee today. I know you'll be saying this about planning um, uh, later in the month. Um, yourself and the members of the committee will have received some time ago the ECOSGEN report um, about EU funding, Chair, and that set out local government's priority for future funding. And then the evidence paper, which you've rightly alluded to, um, uh, received a week or so ago. And, and really, these are prepared following details of the Community Renewal Fund and the Leveling Up Fund, which collectively are multi-annual, multi-billion pound funds designed, in theory anyway, to replace EU structural and social funds. We, uh, along with Solace Chair, have been lobbying on the methods and the impacts of replacement EU funding uh, for as long as the EU exit referendum outcome was known. And we've seen the possibilities for reshaping public funding, ensuring such funds are invested where they're most needed and according to local and to regional priorities. The recent publication, Chairman, of, of details on future funding like this has given some reassurance in terms of the work that investment in local regeneration, community and economic development activities will continue. But in practice, Nonetheless, we regret that this perhaps is an opportunity missed about reshaping how investment is made on the ground. How we turn Northern Ireland's economy from a COVID recovery phase to a unique, multifaceted, sustainable, locally driven economy needs much more local direct investment. Um, we would use the phrase LDI. As foreign direct investment, which we all know about, but it doesn't always embed wealth permanently in the community. Chair, using the emerging programme for government and the 11 councils' community plans, we could possibly plan in public sector investment in the economy in the manner that our government colleagues in Wales, in Scotland, and indeed in much of Europe do. And that is with locality-based budgeting. 
you'll have seen in our paper, Chair, we would believe there's a better way to court specific funds, prosperity going up, and a predecessor, a fund called Community Renewal. In order to minimize duplication and ensure local and regional priorities are at the center of those investment allocations, now, our council colleagues in uh, um, England, Scotland and Wales have been given a role of locally coordinating these bids. And the primary reason for that is to make sure that there isn't competing bids which are of equal quality, but not, neither or both of them get funding, which is going to cause duplication, complexity and small p politics. We don't see that in terms of the very good stakeholders in our local economy that we've got in government in business and in the community. And when we think of an illustration of where it worked, the leader model, program management and steering committees, the EU programs, all three in very different ways, um, and indeed the local action groups, they provided a, a very successful bottom-up rural development and program management context. That principle has been ditched, and that's a, a retrograde step. Chair, notably, none of the new UK funds allow for quarter projects, either on the south and east west, which again seems to be a missed opportunity, particularly given the need to avoid back to back development on a cross border basis and more complementary with other funding schemes. So, this community renewal fund is with us now, it's a good year. We believe that with the committee's support, we can advocate for much greater engagement in designing, delivering, and ensuring complementarity of the future from starting next year. Next year. Those are our introductory remarks, and even since we submitted the paper last week to your committee, there is an update on the multi billion pound lending up fund. The chair, to ensure there's a flow of this evidence and to assist you as chair, we can maybe cover those points and questions. My colleague um, uh, John simply wants to outline just some of the key issues in the this Gen report to help the committee, and then of course we'd be happy to answer your questions and those of your committee members. Okay, well, thank you, Derek. And just uh, chair, if I could just echo Derek's um, thanks for the opportunity to present to the committee today. Um, if I could, I'd just like to start by offering a Belfast perspective on uh, the current EU funding model, you know, just in terms of um, the, the real value that that's brought. So Belfast City Council, through the work of its Economic Development Unit, has supported the organisations that um, have used the um, European structural funds um, by providing advice and support and match funding on specific projects. And some of those projects have and being able to provide vocational training to people so that they can enter the labour market. Um, they've been able to target those furthest from the labour market. Um, they've been able to look at people with disabilities or health conditions and help them gain employment and being able to support people with learning difficulties and autism and provide them with jobs with the future. And we've seen firsthand the work that's been carried out there to deliver those projects into local communities and provide those employment and skills um, that really address that economic hardship for, for people furthest from the, the, the labour market. Now, there are limitations with that model. Um, and really, when we look towards the, the Shared Prosperity Fund, um, we see a real opportunity here um, to to really uh, address some of those limitations. And the, the report that Derek referenced there um, um, makes reference to the UUEPC and in terms of the impact of COVID across Northern Ireland and, and the, the impact on productivity, GDP, job losses. Uh, and really, I think that local government needs to be using the Shared Prosperity Fund in the context of that recovery from COVID. We need, we need to have that flexibility um, to adapt to changes at a local level. Um, so the, the, the priority areas that have been identified by SOLAS for Shared Prosperity Fund really in areas like skills and employability, you know, particularly within the context of COVID in terms of reskilling, upskilling 
and tackling long-term economic inactivity. Um, it also looks at um, areas of business growth where we can uh, help organizations to build resilience and support all stages of business growth and boost those sectors that have future growth prospects and also looks at innovation in terms of that locally led innovation um, and digitization and growing much more innovative businesses. And as Derek has said, you know, it is a focus on place. You know, it is about developing those local partnerships and taking that place-based approach through community planning, through uh, city deals and, um, and partnership working. And it's also about infrastructure in terms of um, you know, how, how can we build on those things that are identified through the city and growth deals in terms of investment in digital, in transport and in hospitality and tourism. So, so those are the areas for the Shared Prosperity Fund that Solis have identified. Um, there's some really important principles that's outlined in the Ecostem report as well that are really important to that fund operating successfully. Um, and as Derek has already said, that alignment is really critical, you know, alignment at that national, regional and local level. And being able to target those funds on local need and taking a very strong collaborative approach with partners, um, you know, councils, invest in I, education, health, the community and, and voluntary sector and industry are all really important partners in making this successful. Um, we also believe that there needs to be a real focus on the outcomes and the impacts that, um, from the, the funding that's used uh, and being able to demonstrate meaningful progress towards targets such as progress being made towards employment. Um, we also think that there needs to be a really flexible approach um, that looks at that local need, but also looks across all the other funding sources that are available. And uh, we do believe that being able to manage uh, and deliver at a local level where that responsibility is devolved is really critical to success. And being able to minimize the bureaucracy um, in terms of the um, the balance between risk um, outcomes and the, the scrutiny and oversight. Um, so those be some of the really important principles that we think are important. Now, of course, that's the shared prosperity fund. Um, our immediate focus right now is, of course, on the community renewal fund and the leveling up fund because the, the funding submission deadline for those is 18th of June. Um, so there's a real opportunity, I think, to um, use particularly the, the community renewal fund as a way of setting out the approach to shared prosperity funds in the long term. Um, and that will give Northern Ireland 11 million pounds for investment during 21-22 to help prepare for that shared prosperity fund. Uh, and the areas of focus there is around the investments of skills, local business, communities in place, and again, supporting people into employment. So a critically important fund and an opportunity there to get some really innovative thinking within that one year funding. Um, they, the, the, in parallel with that, we're looking at the leveling up fund, which is largely capital focus. Uh, and the first round of that will provide projects in Northern Ireland, which are likely to be in the region of 20 million pounds. And the focus there will be on high streets and town centers, uh, regeneration and cultural investment. So with a deadline of 18th of June, we're really busy preparing those submissions um, and keen to make sure that as much as possible, those principles from Shared Prosperity Fund um, are, are seen as part of the, uh, the learning and the approach for the longer term. So just to close then, um, I would say that the, those three funds are really important uh, in terms of being able to target those people most in need through programs that are designed at a local level. And I have to say that I do think that the councils have demonstrated their ability to convene the partners uh, through the COVID recovery work, through the work of community planning partnerships, and through the city and growth deals, um, to be able to work through that partnership approach, develop those local priorities, and to drive that sustainable economic growth. So I do think that the councils are positioned really well to play an important leadership role for those funds. So thank you, Chair. Chair, sure, that's our, um, I suppose, the introductory remarks on context. Rather than, um, you know, go through the, the further technical details, um, I just think it's in the interest of 
political scrutiny that if, if you wanted to um, ask us questions about the funds themselves or, or the wider policy and economic issues, um, uh, it, it, it could happen now. Um, we believe all the pieces of the jigsaw are in place. We just wish that all those pieces are put together in the right way because bottom-up um, uh, economic investment works. So, Chair, open to questions, um, uh, if, if you're willing. Okay, thank, you. Uh, and thank you for your presentation and a, and a note from your, um, your written briefing that you have engaged quite widely with um, parties, other committees and with ministers. Um, could you just ask what you would consider um, the role of the likes of this committee would have um, moving forward? Yes, Chair. Um, uh, certainly from a, um, uh, a, a communication perspective, we feel that uh, as many um, scrutiny committees and, and cross-party bodies as possible uh, should be emphasising the, the, the local and regional design, as uh, Mr Tully ha has just mentioned. There are a number of specific asks, and my colleague Lisa may wish to just amplify some of those to, to assist the record. Um, Chair, we have been engaging quite heavily with MHCLG on the future funding. Um, I think most of the councils would accept that um, the Community Renewal Fund, which is in operation for this year, we have little chance to influence that. Um, however, we want to focus our efforts on making sure that when the Shared Prosperity Fund is, is issued and released and designed, that it takes into account the issues that we've raised in the paper around co-design at local and regional level. We really do believe that the departments and the councils need to be working together so that the community plans, the programme for government, the city and growth deals are all part of that jigsaw and are all funded appropriately, as Derek has, uh, has outlined. We do believe that there has to be a greater role for local scrutiny. Um, you will have noticed in some of the papers for the Leveling Up Fund and the, Shared, uh, the Community Renewal Fund that there's little role for the executive and none for, for councils in determining how um, bids go forward, unlike in GB, where the councils have a very central and critical role to um, avoiding duplication, coordinating the bids that are coming forward from the community and voluntary sectors, the business sectors and the, the government sectors themselves. So we think there's there's a piece of work to be done um, and we'd like to do that in partnership with the executive departments. I'm sure as a regional um, uh, um, coordination role is essential if, if the committee um, uh, wish to support communication directly to MHCLG, for example, Luke Hall MP, who is the minister responsible for investment in the devolved areas, quote unquote, that would be enormously helpful as well. Okay. And you have suggested that you would maybe give uh, some more explanation in relation to the funding itself? Yes, of course, and, and, and we'll keep it um, as, as, as brief and as, as broad as, as possible. Just building on the report. Um, my colleague Lisa, um, if you wanted to maybe offer um, uh, the committee some of the, the headlines in terms of the, the processes as well as the desired outcomes, Lisa. I know John has, has covered some of the content. Um, yes, um, Chair, the, the Community Renewal Fund is uh, for this year only, a um, total of 11, 11 million, which is substantially less than we would have received from EU funding. And, and I know that the departments are, are concerned about that as well. Um, it's unclear at this stage um, who will be bidding for it. I know the councils will all have um, projects. It's unclear if there will be a, a significant bid from some of the arm's length bodies like Invest Northern Ireland or, or any other groups, but it is open as well to groups like Enterprise Northern Ireland um, and business, other business organisations. Um, so again, there's a lack of coordination at the moment and we're trying to sort of work our way through that to ascertain who's doing what. Um, our concern around the Community Renewal Fund is this is meant to be a precursor for the Shared Prosperity Fund. Uh, there's little time to prepare the bids. These bids are meant to be innovative. They're meant to sort of be pilot projects that um, you know pave the way for a bigger project in shared prosperity. 
Um, so the likelihood of new innovative projects is quite low. Um, we've also a concern around the procurement process because if the bids are due in, in June and we are only receiving um, acknowledgement or awards of funding in the summer, if there's a substantial bid made, the procurement process could be 14 to 15 weeks. So you're talking about autumn before um, the projects actually start and for delivery by the end of March. Leveling up is um, accords us a, a greater length of time to prepare bids. Um, however, there is, have been a number of questions raised as to what exactly is on the table. Um, we just discovered on Friday that um, there will be £20 million for Northern Ireland this year. That's across transport, uh, regeneration and culture. And if you take or imagine the size of a transport project, that £20 million will be eaten up very easily. Um, so I think the councils and the departments really need to sit down and work out what is the best for Northern Ireland to put forward in, in those bids that are due in as well uh, in June. I'm happy to take any specific questions on the funds. No, I'm, fine. I'm content that the number of members have indicated. I'm sort of conscious of everyone's time as well, um, and that may be explored in other questions. So, Mr Boylan, thank you very much for that. Mr Boylan. Hello, you hear me all right, yeah? Yes, we can. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Chair. And Derek, you're very welcome on the team. You're, you're welcome back. Um, Derek, yeah, I've just and I listened to Lisa there and John also about the... I have some concerns about the Community Renewal Fund because, I mean, clearly they're bypassing the executive and they're asking local authorities and all to bid. So, I mean, and they, I know that they're going to set up an office in Belfast through, through the, the ministry there. But, I mean... Listen to what you're saying. I mean, realistically, how are we going to get this money into our is most in need? I mean, how how's that going to work? I mean, like the chair did ask what role the, the committee would have, but surely the very fact of bypassing the executive, I mean, we need to be working together in this year to try and try and exploit or expose as much as possible to get them into because council, local council authority know what are is our most in need and what projects are out there. So. How how can we go about that if if this is if there's limited time and limited scope? Well, well I think um, if there's a collective um, uh, push to use the year that we're in this financial year, um, uh, and, and by that I, I, I mean engaging um, with ministers, with Secretary General of MHCLG, uh, to make sure that we are not dealing with another load of new committees, not dealing with another load of new subcommittees or, or tennis match correspondence, but we're actually properly at a regional level, at executive level, looking at a means to coordinate um, uh, all three tiers of government so that any changes coming about are positive and they bring about uh, the long sought, sought after locality-based budgets. So. Yes, um, uh, there may be the, the perception of, 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 of bypass, but to me, um, uh, if we all are working with the same communication and engagement and asking for this to be um, uh, better designed and to have coordination at local and, and regional level, then you are going to avoid the, the possibility of duplication, triplication in, 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 in some cases, you are going to at least bring into the equation this year the ability to have east-west, north-south investment, where at the moment those things aren't in the script. So why we're um, contacting, as, as the chair has said, um, Mr Boylan, um, uh, parties and, and, and all scrutiny committees, I suppose, is to make sure that we are providing consistent and very, very clear evidence of how this can be corrected. So if those are echoed by other committees, uh, then I, I think that's our best way forward. However, my, my one, one or both of my, my colleagues may also wish to amplify that point, Karen, through yourself, yeah. Chair. If I, if I could just um, respond as well, Chair. Um, I mean, I think to, to, to my mind, this is about alignment. Um, and the real challenge is with the timescales around the 18th of June, and there's no denying that it's going to be exceptionally challenging to get that alignment within those timeframes. 
But I think that the opportunity here is around getting as much learning from the Community Renewal Fund embedded in the approach for shared prosperity when it comes on stream. And the alignment there with the community plans and the new program for government, I do think that there's a real opportunity now to move into that space where we got all of those principles that are outlined in the report in place for the Shared Prosperity Fund so that there is that alignment nationally, regionally and locally and there is a true co-design approach because you know it does take all of those tiers to line up to get this right. So I think that's where the opportunity is. No, no I appreciate it, John. I mean, the, the thing is, and it, I'm not saying that you know, what's the best conduit where it's executive or council or collectively work. The the thing is, as long as we have the expertise to try and, you know, access as much as we can to deliver on the ground is the most important thing for us. So, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying the executive should be the model. That's the most important thing is to get the money into the areas of need. Uh, this example. So my, my second question then is, is leading on the SPF and you hear them talk about the British government's home with levelling up and levelling up. How do we ensure that, you know, the money that's coming down the tracks over the next number of years will not be going to big Tory constituencies and big businesses that, that we're going to get our fair slice. And, and I asked that in the context of, do we have the expertise? Is there a model out there? You know, obviously we're only learning this. It's a, obviously it's a new fund. I mean, how can we help or, or, you know, is the model there? Is there a model across some other areas that we can use to try and get as much money out of that fund and get our fair crack at it for sure? Well, well, through yourself, Chair, uh, I, I feel that, I mean, the, the last emphasis that John placed on the previous question, you know, was around um, place-based budgeting, around locality-based budgeting. Um, uh, if we are part of the advocacy to say to MHCLG and indeed government departments that a locality-based budget approach, use the data harvested in the 11 community plans. That data has been underused. It is really rich data, and if harvested, then locality-based budgets, the avoidance of duplication, and going, again, as John and Lisa said through yourself, Chair, to knowledge of where the greatest need is means that you can build, whether it's skills, whether it's digital, you can build it around local or sub-regional. So that, that's the way to do it, but um, I, I guess the, 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 the trick is actually getting those three tiers to fuse together and find that these are properly designed and equally importantly, that they're properly monitored because if some of the schemes aren't hitting the spot, then the funds should be redirected. But getting that model, that pyramid to work is going to be essential during this financial year. Otherwise, it will be opportunity lost. And, and just a final question, Derek, I think you touched on earlier on. I mean, clearly, representing the board of the constituency, there's good opportunities there, but there's, there's challenges too uh, along the board of the corridor. So, I mean, uh, your conversations around that and, and the opportunities within within the model to, to develop those areas as well. Is there any, what's your thinking on that there in terms of the group? Well, certainly we want to avoid what, what might be construed as as back-to-back as -back development. In other words, you know, two good, good projects separately funded when there could be, um, a, a, if you like, a sub-regional approach. But my colleague Lisa is, is doing some work on that, and we have engaged with bodies like the Association of Irish Local Government uh, just to make sure that on a north-south and indeed on an east-west basis, our colleagues in, in England, Wales and Scotland, um, they're all incidentally, our colleagues in Scotland and Wales, they're advocating almost exactly the same thing as we are. So, you know, there is a, a, a clear um, evidence-based push going on, but my colleague Lisa may amplify the point on north-south through yourself, Chair. I would maybe just add that the, none of the UK funds um, at the moment allow for any cross-border working, whether that be north, south or east, west. Um, and I know that certainly the city and growth data partnerships would, would like to extend some of their work. I'm thinking even of the, the Belfast Dublin uh, Economic Corridor. Um, that's a prime transport project that could be funded um, through this, but can't be at the moment. Um, obviously, you'll be aware of the Peace Plus funds, which give which bring together the former Interreg and Peace 
funding. So there, there are opportunities there. And I know the three uh, main cross cross border groups are working up their plans and, and strategies for how to uh, draw down that funding. And um, you'll also maybe want to take a look at the Centre for Cross Border Studies, which has issued a paper just in the last week or two on. Uh, these uh, shared prosperity and levelling up funds and, and their concerns around the, the absence of cross-border working in them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for, for the presentation. I have just a couple of questions. Um, firstly, in relation to the Community Renewal Fund, and. Uh, I know it's been implemented differently here in the north, and, and Cahala touched on some of this as well. Um, and there's been a list of prioritised areas for Britain that has been released. Um, I suppose what was concerning for me was in Wales that some of those most deprived areas have been excluded. So it was just to see how do we ensure that something like that doesn't happen here. Um, it would appear that no such list will be uh, put together for Northern Ireland and MHCLG have indicated that they will be seeking to ensure a balance of regional projects and um, so that it isn't all concentrated in one area. So we, we can only take their word for it and see what comes out um, whenever the first bids are assessed. Okay, well, that's grand. Thank you, Lisa. And that's good. I mean, because it would be very concerning, especially if we have such high levels of deprivation here, we would hate to think that those areas would miss out. Um, where, where are the main areas then where EU funds help people, but we could see gaps in the SPF, like, for example, will social inclusion, access to employment, etc., still be priorities? And if so, can you give a wee bit of detail on those? Well, I would just make a general comment, and maybe John, who is maybe more in tune with the, the skills side, can, can comment. I think our concern at the moment would be there's been a lack of focus on rural development. Um, we were initially told that uh, the former leader programmes, so that the, like the local action groups, would be encompassed within shared prosperity, yet there's no mention of rurality within um, the, the Community Renewal Fund. Um, and as yet, we haven't had anything in terms of regional strategy here in Northern Ireland for um, rural development and how that programme will be replaced. So for us, that's the big gap. John, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I would just just to say that you know both through the the work of the community renewal fund and the bids, which are very much a work in progress at this stage, we're still preparing those. I mean, there is a really strong focus on skills there. Uh, and we would anticipate um, that it would be similar for the Shared Prosperity Fund as well. Um, now, obviously, the bids are taking shape at the moment, and we haven't had those through committee yet to get um, get approval of them. But certainly, I would anticipate that that, that level of focus on um, skills for employability, um, digitisation skills and so forth would still remain a focus. Okay. And do you think then, I suppose, because that's actually a really important point around the gap in, in rurality and, and, you know, I know particularly in my own area, rural development funding was critical. Um, so is there, do you think there should be the scope then that that's something that could be considered as part of that? I think we'll have to see what, um, well, both what MHCLG propose, if they're going to carve out a rural strand within the Shared Prosperity Fund, our reading so far would indicate that's not the case. And um, so we're really waiting on the Department um, for Agriculture and Environment and Rural Affairs bringing forward their their new agricultural strategy or rural development strategy, uh, which we've been waiting on for some time. I know the Department were sort of probably thinking that there'd be an allocation of money and, and thematic expenditure across um, shared prosperity, but that hasn't materialised. Okay, and, and at any stage, were, were you or any other local government stakeholder consulted by the British government on the design of the Shared Prosperity Fund? We were invited to one meeting probably in 2018, um, and we were, we were just asked general questions. There was no paper, there was no framework, no outline um, that we could comment on. So our first sight of this was when it was launched at the just after the spending review. Okay, and I suppose, I mean, then, that's, then we're just here sort of waiting to see then what's, what's coming. Okay, look, thank you both for your answers. I mean, that's been very helpful. Thanks a million. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Anderson.
Um, th thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks for the presentation. And I was listening intently to uh, to all that you were saying, particularly with regards to the lack of consultation. And unfortunately, everything that I feared was going to happen when we were told that the British government would replace European funding. Um, 3.5 billion is going to be launched ultimately here to the north. And you just can see by the process that you have been involved in, the lack of it, the consultation around the Shared Prosperity Fund, that the North, once again, is going to see a massive reduction in funds and it's going to impact on the communities that we all serve. Can I ask, Derek, I was very interested in the comment that you made, and this is probably around policy, because you talked about you know, how foreign uh, direct investment you know, doesn't embed really investment uh, in communities. Now, obviously, important as it has been, but I've been doing quite a, a bit of extensive work here in Derry around the community wealth building. And I'm wondering, has Solus taken a look at any of that, particularly the Preston model, um, because it looked at how local communities could generate their own wealth, um, looked at having an inclusive economy, and aligning, it was something that I'm not sure it was yourself or Lisa had talked about procurement practices and the length of time is going to take around procurement. But I think there's a number of other pillars we need to be looking at. You know, procurement in council is different to procurement in the assembly. Uh, we know, for instance, the work that Connor Murphy has done around changing the procurement board and Colin uh, Jess and others, for instance, from the social enterprise. And I'm just concerned based on what was said about the lack of attention and focus, the lack of opportunity that there will be in the north for um, given once we have the European funding removed completely, that we need to be looking at, at ways within which we can generate or change how we do business. Dairy, for instance, is one of the highest levels of working age adults uh, with either low levels of qualifications or none at all. So when you're talking about the skills agenda and we're looking at new deck, we're looking at the opportunity from city to an inclusive uh, inclusive growth and in that as has been said is is there's cross-border all Ireland work being done and yet the shared prosperity fund there's an absence of rural development there's an absence of uh, cross-border all Ireland work so I'm wondering because it hasn't I haven't heard you reference it have you been looking at community wealth building have you been looking at the Preston model have you been looking at solace on any work on that because I think that's going to be crucially important going forward um, in, in a word, uh, yes, um, we have taken on the concept, the policy of community wealth building and, and Nilga actually travelled to Preston with a small group of elected members and officers from across the 11 councils and, and brought the concept practically back to our, our councils um, uh, here in NI and indeed um, uh, John from a Belfast perspective, I know there's been, if you like, a a recalibration of the Preston model, and, and he may be able to uh, just just give some of the headlines related to to, to, to to that. Yeah, thanks, Derek. I mean, yes, yeah, certainly there there is very much a blended approach being taken in terms of, you know, obviously um, we have a large number of SMEs that need focus at the moment in terms of COVID recovery, um, and you know, giving them a, a focus is, is is very foremost in our minds. But certainly that. That concept of um, the the Preston model and community wealth building has been a, a really important part of the community planning approach in Belfast, and the concept of a city charter is being developed, where you know, we would use the the power of uh, anchor institutions across the city in terms of procurement, recruitment, and so forth, as a, as a way of uh, furthering that inclusive growth agenda. Um, and there has been um, continued linkages with Preston. And they've advised us throughout um, the, 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 um, the the work of that city charter. Uh, and there's been recent work both through, with community planning and also through uh, the council as well on the community wealth building model to, to further develop that and look at practical ways that we can embed that across the city as well. And, and through the chair, pardon, pardon me, Ms. Anderson, through the, through the chair, what we would respectfully suggest to, to this committee 
um, is the encouragement of utilizing the community planning models because each of the community wealth building models are different. They're locality based and the utilization of those models within these funds um, would make an enormous difference to both impact and the pace of getting a new economy in a post-COVID environment. All 11 councils' community plans have been COVID changed to reflect um, uh, the, the new period ahead. So it, it's, it's immensely important that the model of community plans are used in these funds going forward uh, and any support um, uh, communicated by the committee chair um, would be, I think it would benefit NI, full stop. It isn't about institutions here, councils, departments, it is about citizens. Um, I, I, I think in relation to what you're saying, it's crucially important. And I would also suggest um, just a note, note of caution. And if perhaps I, um, I misread some of the material that came through, but I was a little bit concerned when, you know, when you made reference to the level up agenda needed across the North. Now, I'm somebody who would absolutely concur with the few of needing to make sure as a new decade, new approach, money needs to be allocated based on an objective need and it needs to go where it is needed and where you have the empirical evidence and there's lots of us telling us where that needs to happen. But I think when you use the language that the Tory government is using about the levelling up agenda, this is only my view, that you fall into a trap potentially of nearly the justification of what they are going to do and that is to, to strip away money from the north to take away revenue from the north to not deliver on the promise that was made during brexit for those who believe that that is and uh, that the british government was going to replace european funding so just when i listened to lisa and when you were saying about the the lack of um rural development for instance within that it didn't surprise me but it was something that i wanted to say in this city in derry um, you know, as I said about the, the level of sort of low qualifications or whatever, but we suffered from constant high levels of unemployment and joblessness. Uh, indeed, there hasn't been full employment since partition. So it's going back to what you were talking about, the um, community wealth building of how public money that is spent, for instance, my own constituency in Derry and other MLAs probably be the same in theirs. I want to ensure and we want to ensure that the opportunities for individuals are fairly distributed and that the, those that are pushed to the margins, those that are further away in, in terms of trying to get access to those opportunities are supported effectively uh, so that they access what's on offer. So it sort of fits in with what you're saying about the work that you have done. And I think what you have said to us about you know, making sure that we look at the community planning because of what has been done in council, and this has to be about bottom up um, engagement and a process that ensures that the allocation of funding goes to where it is most in need. My difficulty is that I just don't believe the British government uh, ever intended to replace the volume of European funding that is going to impact on our streets, on our communities, on community organisations across the North, regardless of their, their political preference, and it's going to impact badly. Um, being dragged out of the EU, that's going to be another consequence of it. Um, uh, through, through yourself, and, and thank you, Ms. Anderson, through the chair, I mean, our, our response, um, as you can imagine, is, is um, we're, we're keen to sweat the asset of any funding that hits our streets. Um, so, you know, we're, we're you know, not looking at uh, the ideology or the consequences of things. What we're doing is wanting to sweat the asset. The best way to do that is the manner that's been described in the ECOSGEN report and our, our briefing paper, regardless of whether it's a Stormont department or whether it's MHCLG or whether it's um, uh, um, Interreg funding. We believe uh, the best way to do this is to, is to remodel how economic investment and economic development is, is, is run here. And now is the time to do it as we move from COVID recovery to transformation. Um, Chair, um, through yourself. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Ms. Skelly. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks for the presentation. It's just a couple of things I, I, w I wouldn't mind some uh, clarity on. Um, and it's uh, interesting to note uh, that uh, whilst uh, 
the British government would try to suggest that is about giving more power to local uh, places and local authorities. Uh, it does seem to be about disempowering uh, d the devolved regions, particularly given that the authority rests with uh, the British uh, Communities and Housing Minister. Um, can I ask, I know in some councils there have been recent discussions around regeneration powers and a greater uh, devolution of powers from uh, the Assembly to councils. Where do you think uh, the gaps are that would enable a greater uh, holistic approach uh, to allow the councils to take the lead, uh, particularly around the delivery of the community uh, plans? And then, um, do you uh, anticipate any difficulties in terms of the differential of statutory functions uh, across the devolved regions, but particularly in the case of um, England uh, and Wales, I think, where um, councils have greater authority over roads, for example, maintenance, and indeed our hospital and social care. And then, in relation to uh, the community and voluntary sector, who have played such a critical role over many years in terms of um, delivering services across uh, the north, um, how do you see that working in terms of collaboration across NGOs, or will there be uh, a lot of duplication and duplication of effort? And I suppose, um, finally, Chair, I would just want to express my real concern about the lack of ability to um, match up with and uh, join forces, if you like, with the Taoiseach Shared Island unit in terms of the delivery of uh, projects. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just suppose if I could start with the, the, the point about regeneration. Um, we feel that a legislative change that brings regeneration powers to councils would, would, would simply provide them with the four dimensions, the competitive advantage to do the, the rebuilding of infrastructure investment, economic, social economy work better and faster. The template exists elsewhere. And um, that is why, you know, from a policy point of view, uh, Nilga would be looking to have that legislative uh, change, that transfer of regeneration powers in terms of resource and legislative impact um, uh, as, as soon as is politically or practically and practically possible. In, in terms of, of the points about the differentials, which is another good point um, uh, um, uh, raised, um, because councils have um, here in, in NI, Broadly, similar economic development, local economic development powers can invest uh, across different um, uh, uh, coordinated ways. Um, the, the, the benchmark basically is being applied here already, which is why we wanted the local councils here to have that coordinating role to avoid the, the potential for duplication. Uh, the other point I would make in response to the sort of the three tiers of of, of, of uh, well-articulated questions um, uh, w would be that in terms of the voluntary and community sector, the councils are regularly looking to commission bodies such as social economy organisations, such as small business organisations, rather than have an institutionally led approach to it. And that's one way to have much greater uh, local knowledge and impact uh, in delivering uh, these schemes. So my colleagues, um, uh, um, Lisa and John, may wish to um, amplify those points just in relation to, uh, as I understood it, um, uh, Mrs. Kelly, the three uh, layers that you mentioned there. Um, so they, they may wish to come in through the, through the chair's indulgence. Yeah, I'll, I'll just comment briefly, if I could, Chair. Um, yeah, in terms of the regeneration power, um, I agree with everything Derek has said in terms of the the opportunity that that legislative change would have in terms of that local place making and addressing local need. Um, absolutely, and, and the way that that was set within the broader role of councils, uh, you know, in terms of community planning and that place making approach, I think it, it, it's um, uh, it, it's one that. Uh, that, that really um, would, would be welcomed. Um, I would mention as well just the links with um, the community involvement sector. I mean, obviously, the, the initial COVID response 
um, I think really strengthen that relationship with the community and voluntary sector. Um, and that continues to grow through the community planning model in Belfast. And, you know, we have a, a sector advisory panel from the community and voluntary sector that um, sit on all of the boards of our community planning um, structures and uh, advise. And in fact, I'm co-chairing a meeting this afternoon with the chair of that panel in relation to, to um, community planning. So again, I would just emphasize the opportunity here that if we get that alignment and if we can remove that duplication through that joined up and co-design approach, you know, I think that we could really make a difference through this funding uh, if, if, if we get that model right. Um, so certainly, you know, getting that linkage through to community planning um, and alignment with the new program for government again, I would just emphasize the importance of that. Thank you, Chair. I would maybe just add a point, Chair, on the Shared Island Initiative. I think there is a, an opportunity that we're going to miss by not joining up the two funds, and that will be of particular interest for your own committee, given that uh, so many of the Shared Island projects are likely to focus on transport and uh, improving transport across the island. So I think that's something that we can um, perhaps work on jointly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Beggs. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? we can. We can. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, thanks. Thanks for the update. And, and I've been looking uh, closer at the uh, information on HMG's um, website regarding this. And um, it's clear there's quite a lot of criteria and detail about how the process is to be managed um, in in Great Britain, and primarily around uh, local authorities. Uh, um, but a, a, a really dearth of information regard to Northern Ireland, uh, other than inviting bids from a wide range of um, applicants, um, councils, community and voluntary sector, universities, perhaps the education. Uh, so there is a huge danger of too many applications going in, which might be weak, or perhaps not even enough. Uh, I, I, I think there does need to be greater clarity uh, for Northern Ireland, and that local uh, authorities here could play uh, a significant role in that process. So my, my question is, which of any um, ministers have a role in Northern Ireland in liaising um, with Her Majesty's government in terms of this scheme uh, applicable to Northern Ireland? Is it the Executive Office? Is it the Department for the Communities? Is it Department for Economy? Is it the Department of Infrastructure? To me, there needs to be greater clarity around it, and I thought it's probably with the, the Executive Office at the minute. Would that be correct? Lisa? Uh, my understanding is it's been led by the Department of Finance. And they're working quite closely with the um, ministers in Wales and Scotland to highlight the concerns that the three devolved regions would have. Right. Uh, I just, again, looking at some of the criteria being set for uh, Great Britain, I think I spotted somewhere that all the expenditure has to be uh, completed by March uh, 2022. So it's this uh, financial year. Um, and the applications are, are just going in, uh, in, in, in in June. There's then a deciding process. So uh, it's all going to be very fast. And there's probably limit limits in, in being able to deliver uh, a, a good long-term project from from this. Um, uh, ha, ha, has there been any clarity come from the Department of Finance? I and mean, if they're leading it, are you are you addressing the Finance Committee and the Finance Minister? Um, just the, the short answer to the last part of the, the question, uh, Mr. Beggs, to the chair is yes. We have um, once we've got information. And once we've um, uh, uh, sought information, we then um, uh, offer that to, to finance. And indeed, in terms of, of, of ministers, we have um, brought this subject up, provided the report to, to parties and ministers, both in, in, in Stormont and uh, also in, in Westminster. So from our side, we've made sure that information as it happens and as it changes is articulated to, to those who need it most which brings me back to the idea of if, if we're able to work collectively uh, as, as, a, as a regional 
uh, design and scrutiny and measurement body with councils materially involved. Look what they did under European regional development funding and social funding in terms of small businesses. Look what they did in terms of the local action groups for rural development. They brought in the local community and they got a bigger bang for their buck. Then that's the way forward. I appreciate Mr. Beggs, uh, um, uh, you know, your, your point about you know, making sure that principal departments and ministers are on this. Um, we're doing everything we can to make sure they are, and we're coupling with them uh, as, as we try and um, uh, look at the design and the content moving forward. The, the, the other, I mean, I, 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 I share your, your, your desires to try and um, uh, have a great engagement bottom up and, and engage with the councils and their uh, community planning. Um, but given what, given the time scales, is that really going to be practical in this financial year, or, or is this planning for a scheme which might run next financial year? Uh, Lisa, do you want to, to come in? I mean, we're we're uh, um, we're we're aware that this is um, uh, the year in which we have to get the future model right. So there may be some opportunity lost in this financial year, to be frank. But my colleague Lisa uh, may wish to um, uh, add to that. Yes, there's 11 million available in this financial year and time is tight, as you've referred to, in getting those bids in assessed, procured and delivered and financed by the end of March. Um, and as Derek mentioned, you know, our focus needs to be on making sure that that short process that has had little um, co-design with the councils is substantially altered uh, when the real Shared Prosperity Fund comes in next year. <laughs> And I just also add that we've been quite impressed with the level of engagement we've had from MHCLG. We've had access uh, when we needed to, to the de departmental officials. Um, they've been very forthcoming and listening to our concerns around the, the need for something localised here that looks at those coordination and duplication issues that, that you, you've raised. Uh, so hopefully that message will be heard. I, I, I mean, I, I hope some of the hope will be heard, but I think there does need to be a high-level engagement to get a, a, a greater level of involvement coming um, from, from uh, people on the ground in Northern Ireland, and our local councils uh, uh, could, could well play that role uh, in coordinating. Um, so I think there does need to be engagement with that at, at our uh, executive level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to come back with a supplementary or are you content? Okay, no, thank you. Thank you very much, um, all of you, for your presentation and for taking questions this morning and certainly something that is now very much in the mind now of, of members of the committee um, and where we can be of assistance, we, we will. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair, and, and very good to, to, to see you and your colleagues um, this morning. Uh, we'll be back about planning later in the month. <laughs> okay, see you then, Derek. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Okay, members. Okay, moving then to our next briefing, which is from the Construction Employers Federation, and this is in regard to the review of the 2011 Planning Act. And again, Hansard will record the meeting. Um, the submission from um, CEF is at page 136 of your pack, and we will welcome attending via Starleaf um, David Fry, who is Director of External Affairs Construction from the Construction Employers Federation. Let's wait for him to come. Good morning, David. You're very welcome back to the committee. Morning. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. If you would like to um, make some opening comments and uh, colleagues will ask questions after that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, and many thanks to yourself, Chair, and the committee for affording me the opportunity to brief you today on our response to the call for evidence on the review of the 2011 Act. Uh, as a reminder, the CEF is the certified representative body for the construction and house building industry, which employs 
around 30,000 staff in Northern Ireland. Uh, we have over 800 member companies ranging from micro businesses employing a handful of people to the largest construction and house building companies locally. Uh, I'll take the opportunity now to go through the headline points of our response and happy to take questions as I go along, um, obviously at the end. Um, and, and just following how the call for evidence was structured, if you look first at local development plans, um, some six years on from the transfer of the majority of the powers to the councils, um, we remain obviously some way off from the adoption of the first generation of LDPs and the subsequent local policies plans. Um, from our members, that's hugely challenging given the development community's need for plans to be relatively up to date. While of course we can understand that the councils did take a period of time to adapt to their new powers and responsibilities, we do believe that now would be an appropriate time to simplify certain processes so that future plans can be brought forward in a timely manner. We therefore ask that an independent working group be established with the task of improving the form and content of development plans, but also the processes by which they are drawn up. That group could consider, for instance, changes such as bringing the requirement in line with the statutory requirement in other jurisdictions of a new plan or a refresh plan every five to six years, tighten up the ability of any individual council to alter the timetable for their LDP. Presently, this can be done as many times as the council sees fit. Uh, we would recommend that this be altered so that it can be done with certain exceptional circumstances only. Clarify the reasons and circumstances within which DFI would seek to intervene on any specific council which is not meeting its LDP timetable and or is bringing forward policies in their draft LDP which conflict with documents such as the strategic plan and policy statement and other relevant executive strategies. And given the lengthy time scales that will reinform any councils adopting their first LDP, never mind their local policies plan, we believe that in future there is a strong argument for evidence gathering, consultation and drafting processes running concurrently for both. Turning then to plan and control, uh, our response makes a series of suggestions which are based on our members' experience of the two-tier system, as well as a number of significant reports which are noted in our submission. Firstly, on pre-application discussions for major and regionally significant applications, we believe there should now be a statutory requirement. However, key to doing this must be that all statutory consultees are legislatively obliged to take full part in PAD as, without this over the last six years, it has meant that PAD has not had the cross-the-board effectiveness that it should have done. PAD should remain proportionate to the type and scale of application that is in consideration, so a matrix approach could be considered as a means to make this clear to potential applicants at an early stage. With respect to pre-application community consultation, we are pleased to be part of the Minister's Planning Engagement Partnership and look forward to it completing its work in the summer. Separate to this, there are a number of changes that could be made to pre-application community consultation via this review in our, in our view. The temporary changes to public consultation brought in because of the pandemic must be made permanent. Online and remote consultation is a hugely beneficial accompaniment to the other types of consultation prescribed in the Act and should be given equal weight. Also, the 12-week minimum PAC process for major and regionally significant applications should be reduced to eight weeks minimum where applicants have demonstrated to the relevant planning authority within the proposal of application notice that meaningful engagement with the community can be delivered. Looking at the actual then handling of applications, um, which is pretty important in terms of the, how our members have seen the last six years. So we would take the view that all planning authorities should now develop mandatory application checklists through a matrix approach that is based on the type and scale of development. Processing agreements should be agreed by planning authorities and proposed applicants for all major and regionally significant applications, which these agreements clearly detail in the timetable from PAN to application decision to which all parties, including consultees, are obliged to stand over. That obligation must also now be extended towards statutory timeframes within which consultees must respond to major and regionally significant applications. The current approach has been proven not to work and it needs to be enhanced with a statutory requirement. Planning authorities could be able to set these timeframes within the above processing agreements 
so that timeframes can be responsive to the type and scale of application that is being considered. Where council fees do not respond or respond substantively within the time scales that all parties have agreed to in a processing agreement, then the planning authority must have the right to determine an application without further delay. Additionally, where council fees seek to request further information from an applicant so to inform their own response, they must issue this request in a timely manner. We believe that period should be no more than eight weeks. When it comes to post-application uh, approval, our members regularly engage with us regarding to have to submit new applications for already approved developments where they are seeking minor amendments or non-material changes. This, given what happens in other jurisdictions, seems a wholly unnecessary restraint on development and the review should seek to lay out clear definitions of acceptable amendments and non-material changes to existing permissions, given that the Act currently does not. Um, and while we accept the role of planning conditions in enhancing the quality of development and enabling development to proceed where it otherwise would not, there is a fine line between this and what our members have commonly reported to us. Conditions must be fair, reasonable and practicable, as we have seen, particularly on new built housing developments, a significant growth in pre-commencement conditions which we believe could be sufficiently discharged during the development phase rather than in advance of it. From this review, we would, at the very least, request that the Department urgently review Development Management Practice Note 20, and that this review is done with industry, who can bring a significant number of examples forward as unnecessary pre-commencement conditions. Building on this, this may be an appropriate moment to review all existing Development Management Practice Notes, I think there's about 25 in total, and their ongoing applicability and or a need for amendment. Finally, one other area that was picked up in the review was uh, with regard to the pandemic and recovering from it. Uh, given the ongoing uncertainty as to what our economic recovery uh, looks like and indeed how long it may take, we believe there is a very strong argument to extend the permissions for developments which have been held up from commencing construction over the last year and are due to lapse. With the economic challenges that we face, however, this would need to be kept under continuous review in the event that the commercial market, particularly, takes longer than hope to recover to its pre-pandemic levels. Equally, such extensions to existing permissions should also be considered where wastewater treatment capacity issues are the critical issue in the holding up of any specific development. So there are a number of other areas that we have focused on in our response, but we believe that what we have detailed today are the most obvious areas for reform that can unlock our planning system. So, Chair, that completes my remarks. Uh, once again, thank you for the committee's time and happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and David, thanks very much. David, just have, have three points to make. David, just in terms of the, you're saying there about the, um, you you need you want the department to take up the ability of councils to alter their timetables in the LDP process. Well, you you know what impact is that in the sector and on just your views on that point? Uh, I think the point is that at, the, at this present moment in time, the the councils can change their LDP timetable pretty much as they see fit according to the legislation. I think our view on that is a number of the councils have changed their timetables over the last few years, um, and it, it's sort of got to a point now where it's very hard to know really with certain councils how long it is going to be before we are at, say, PAC examination stage, adoption, where when we then get on to the LPP. Uh, and for, for a lot of our members, I think particularly in areas where there's a number of areas in the country where there haven't really been refreshes to plans for maybe two decades and, and that that is getting to a point now where it's very hard to know um, about where you can put investment what land remains zoned um, it's very challenging therefore to make investment decisions on that basis um, you can start to build your profile of investment have, with having a broad sense of where individual councils are going but at this stage, for a number of those councils, that does still seem quite a far way off. So I think... Yeah, go on, Adia. 
No, sorry, sorry, that was. Oh no, no, I was just going to say. But I mean, I'm just trying to think back to legislation because it was there part of the process. But would that require a legislative process change in terms of three teams? I, I, I think the legislation had indicated the period of time for 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 LDPs. No. Yes, it had, it had, it, but I think the, the predominant issue is that each council is now way, way north of the, of the period of time. And, and that's the issue is that, you know, we all, all saw the councils coming forward with their LDP timetables, but pretty much all have shifted those drastically since. And, and, and it's that point there, it's, it's the rationale and reasoning for why you're changing your LDP timetable. Um, and at this present moment in time, as far as we can see, most of the timetables are shifted because you know they just need to shift them uh, and for for a development community trying to see where they can make an investment that you know that that doesn't really help you chart out, chart out your future no and there's something obviously for the committee to chair to uh, to have a chat with the, with the department about just in terms of the the soundness test i mean you mm-hmm. know the, the definition could you could you detail that or expand a wee bit on that in relation to your briefing yeah so that that's something that I think at this juncture, having looked at some of the councils and the proposals that they've brought forward, how exactly we define soundness. You know, what what you know when when we look at, for instance, uh, um, a lot of what the council, the individual councils are doing with respect to housing allocations is they've looked at the housing growth indicators. Um, now we would historically have had our issues with the housing growth indicators. Not like a lot of our industry would think they should be higher, but that notwithstanding. The piece there for us around soundness, whenever we've looked at what the councils have been moving forward, has been if Belfast shoots very high and it takes up the bulk, say, of a housing growth indicator, does that mean all the other councils have to fall into line uh, with Belfast, you know, once the PAC have looked at their plan? And then when you come to the question of soundness, uh, when you're supposed to be developing plans in line with other policies and guidance that is out there, uh, I think the issue for us is without that very clear definition of what is sound, um, we, we're still kind of conf- confused as to how do the PAC look at that and then how do, for instance, other councils take cognizance of that if the PAC, for instance, say that Belfast plan is sound. Yeah. So that, therefore, does that mean the other councils say, particularly around the Belfast donut, have to revise their housing figures downwards? Because we're all working off the HDIs, so it's it's that it's that that piece. Just whenever we've been looking at it, if, if you're trying to develop a plan on the basis of the evidence that's available to you, I think the definition of soundness probably needs to be tightened up a bit. No, no, fair enough, and I know myself because I responded to the, the New York Morning Down, also the ABC one, um, the housing growth indicators. That that's a big a big issue because I mean. Not only are you you're going to develop, but then you've the issue of NAW and the sewage treatment plants and all those things that goes along with it, and and that holds some of the things back. But I wouldn't be looking towards Belfast as you know. I mean, each individual area should have their own. You know, it's unique to each individual area and how it grows, and that's. But but just a final point, and I mean, I've had a wee bit of a gripe with this in, in terms of it's it's down to the applicants itself and the application process. I mean, you, you know yourself. You, you have to have all the A's dotted and the T's crossed, even if you're going into a pod. You know, what, what can we do in terms of checklists for, for the actual applicants? Because it's held the process up as well in, in times. You know, I mean, I think we're getting better at it. But whatever we can do to ensure that applicants coming in, they're, they're coming around the table, you know, with all those A's dotted and the T's crossed, how, how, can, we, how can we ensure that happens in the future? As part of this process, where I can, you know, yeah, well, 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 although I might have to quote Belfast again, I mean, Bel- Belfast City Council over the last couple of years have developed a pretty good application checklist, right. and I think a lot of our members have found that find that very useful. Uh, you, you know, very early on what you're going to need to provide, when you're going to need to provide it, and I think importantly for us, and we would have said this over a number of years, is you know, there has to be the ability for a council to, if applications are put in by, you know, and they're put in and they're not particularly good standard, you know, yes, you can go back to the applicant and request more information, but you can't, you know, the back and forward piece has to work for everybody. You know, we obviously have a lot of issues with statutory consultees and the back and forward element of that, but on the same side, um, where we represent our members and other developers, 
they have to make sure that what they're giving in is right and proper and that they're answering the questions and that they're doing it in a timely manner. I, I think one of the things about this review and I, I, you know, pre pre previous to working for the CEF, I worked for the CBI around the time of the transfer of, of planning powers. We sometimes get quite caught up on the on time scales for taking decisions, and yes, they are very, very important. But equally, it's also the certainty of 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 of, of getting the decision taken. You know, I, I have seen a number of of our members talk about bringing forward developments, major developments, several hundred units in some cases. And yes, you'd be looking for those, you know, to be approved, you know, to, to, for the application to be considered in a certain time frame. But equally, the time frames are so far off that it's it's not even really worth you setting a time frame down. It's more at this stage now about I don't really if I if I'm looking at buying a piece of land in any given council area, I and say I'm planning to build a hundred units. I'm, I'm almost guessing how long it'll be before I can get permission for it, even if I do everything right and it's in line with planning policy, it's in line with housing need, I've engaged well with the local community. I, 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 you, you really don't have a clue how long it's going to take. Uh, I, 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 I'm aware of, of one particular, again, quoting quote Belfast, I'm aware of one particular development in Belfast, uh, several hundred units apartment block on, on a builder rent scheme where you know, they could be looking at a planning decision in a year's time, you know, but, but maybe maybe longer. It's a complete, it's a complete unknown. Yeah. And, and that, that's certain. And that's where I think processing agreements could, we think, could help a lot. Um, no, I appreciate that. And it's, it's bottled there for us at the minute, but hopefully after this review, I mean, we'll tighten up some of those checks and balances in the checklist. Thanks very much for your responses. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Muir. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and apologies for my lateness. Um, and thank you, David, for your presentation. Um, and a good element of what you've uh, presented, and which is which is in your paper, is something that I would agree with. Um, there's many changes that can be made to improve our planning system, so it can deliver for people, communities, and businesses. Um, just in terms of the many um, items, and suggestions within your paper and your presentation, there's a good proportion of that that can be delivered without legislation because obviously legislation takes a while to be able to progress what particular item do you think that should be progressed as a matter of urgency this year to enable us to improve our planning system i think well certainly where we, where, where, where our members find the most issues is the piece around statutory consultees and the lack of a response or the lack of a substantive response and the inability of, of councils, again, it might be more legislative, I suppose, but the inability of councils to be able to, in effect, call that process to, to an end. That, that, that seems to be, and, and look, we fully understand and we engage with, with the statutory consultees ourselves a lot as a membership organisation. We understand the challenges they have in terms of particularly resources. We, we get that, we hear that a lot from them, but, but that's where an awful lot of applications are held up. And then equally, they're then held up in a ping pong exercise after you've had a substantive response. So that, that, that for us is a big issue. I think where other councils have brought forward application checklists, that's been a big help because it means at the front end, you're better able to front load what an applicant is expected to do. Uh, so, and there's an obligation on our members and the wider development community to, to do that. I think that's pretty important. But yes, certainly we would quite regularly come back to the statutory consultees. That, that's where the issue predominantly is for our members, uh, I have to say. Yeah, it probably relates to my sort of next question. There's a 30-week target for major applications being processed by district councils. Um, and just whether your view is if that can be achieved and we can start getting towards delivering that this year, or is it a major impediment the statutory consultation, what do you feel is the other major, or is there another major impediment to achieving that 30 week uh, deadline? I, I think, as I said to, to Mr. Boylan previously, you know, we, we are very, very focused here on, on, the, on the time frames. One of the things that's always struck me talking to our members and others is the piece around 
certainty. If they were engaged in things like if, if PAD worked properly and if you had processing agreements and people were entering into them, all parties were entering into them in good faith, then you know it, it, it may well be that you don't meet the 30-week target, but at least you have a time frame very early on of, of where you're going and how you're going to get there. Um, there's a large piece in that around the certainty element. You know, if, if you're coming in with a large amount of investment, um, you know, in some cases several tens of millions for rather relatively large schemes, you want to broadly know when you're going to be able to hit the ground. Now there are obviously other challenges like wastewater treatment and, and, and things like that. But the one thing I get time and time again is our members don't talk too much about the but they obviously talk about the time frames in the sense that most of the councils don't get too close to them. But equally, I think they would appreciate more certainty in what they're getting involved in. If that can be provided, and you can do that maybe in certain ways, through having a better PAD process, through having processing agreements, I think we've often said as well in the past where a 50-unit housing application in, say, your constituency and a 50-unit housing application in, in ABC Council, depending on where they are in each constituency, those applications could be very, very different. Very different. And one might require a, a lot, not an element more time consideration on the part of statutory consultee, be it the NI Water, be it the Environment Agency, be it the AFI Roads. Uh, you know, and, and, and that's something where... Uh, Perhaps the statutory consultees feel that if there was a bit more leeway given to them, if applications were going to be very difficult for them to come back quickly on, if our members were entering into that with the certainty of, of an outcome, but it might take a, a bit longer, um, I think they'd be, they would be willing to do that. Mm. Um, but yes, certainly at the minute, you know, the, 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 the timescales for taking decisions, you know, that they are largely irrelevant. Um, yeah, the other one's just around the LDPs. It's more a comment, really, but I just think if there's not a change in the process around that, some of these LDPs will never see the life of day because they'll be stuck in the judicial review process and we'll still be going back to, you know, area plans developed in the 90s. So there really needs to be change in relation to that because the, the length of delay and getting these things off the ground is just it's atrocious. And I think you've really touched upon that, so you have. So. Yeah, no, that's something that comes up quite a bit. You know, a number of our members would say to us, you know, there are certain parts of the country where there hasn't been a plan for 20 years. There's not really much zoned land left. What zoned land there is left it comes with challenges. You know, they need, and, and broadly then speaking, you, you're then trying to work with a council on an application for a piece of land, which that council may no longer see the same way as, it would, as its predecessor would have done 20 years ago. So, but yes, those time frames, you know, I think we are now way north of what was the original timetable for any of the 11 councils. Yeah. Um, and there is, with one or two exceptions, uh, I think Turley had done a piece of work recently uh, where they where they would regularly update. And, you know, the earliest you're probably looking is still at least a year and a bit away. Um, and then the, the really important, bit, actually, this is the thing, the really important bit for our members probably actually comes after that because that's the local policies plan. Mm. In effect, the call for sites, that, that, that actually for, for a lot of our members is where the real meat is. Um, and, and, and that's why we've kind of suggested that perhaps in the future it'd be better to run those processes concurrently because you're gathering a lot of the same information. Yeah, it's just all taken far too long. Um, thank you very much, David. It's appreciated. And thank you, Chair. And apologies again for my lateness. Thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you uh, for the presentation. It's just a couple of questions, I suppose some of it's um, been discussed, but just in terms of the, the pre-application discussion for, for major and, and regionally significant plan applications, um, I know you've said that you, you believe that it should be a, a statutory requirement. Um, can you give a wee bit more detail on the experience that the sector has had with PADS and why you think it, would be mandatory, it should be mandatory for all application, all major applications? Yes, so, uh, so a number of our members have been involved with them. Um, again, I'm going to say that, I'm afraid to say Belfast City Council as often as I do, but again, Belfast probably has been in the lead with these, to, to be absolutely fair to them. And what they have found is where they have brought the statutory consultees in at an early stage, 
it gives you a much better understanding of what is possible, what is achievable, and the time frame for, for doing these things. Um, so I think if you're, you know, at the minute, if, if you don't have that pad element and you're going straight to PAM and, and pre-application community consultation, there is, uh, you know, probably a lot of evidence out there where the first the statutory consultees are aware of the application is when they're, they're consulted about it. Um, I think if you're bringing people like that in much earlier on in the process, it stands a better chance of knowing what is achievable and what is what is not achievable. Um, and certainly, our members, where they have been required or where, where they have wanted to get involved in PAD, they they have all done so, and the experience broadly of them has been pretty positive. Yeah, and I suppose that makes sense. I mean, I know even just on a smaller scale in terms of plan, I would always have advised people to go and speak to somebody and kind of look at all of that and even on paper. So I can see where you're coming from. Um, you also mentioned that you're part of the Ministerial Plan and Engagement Partnership, what's currently looking at in the, in the planning process. And you said if you'd like to enhance pre application community consultation, what ways do you think that you, you'd like to see that happening? Well, certainly one of the main things is I think the changes that have been brought in as a result of the pandemic with respect to online or remote consultation, uh, the, the feedback from those has been very positive. I think probably the department, I'd like to hope the department would say that too. Um, obviously, with time, you want to go back to the public event again, but I don't think you would you would take the online and remote out because I think that opens up a different way of communication which maybe weren't being used as much before. So that is something with, which I think can be changed and, and that would be quite beneficial and, and just sort of bring us more in line with, you know, in a way, modernity, I suppose. Um, um, that's probably for us on the, on the, on the PAC side, that's probably the, the main thing that we would like to see. You know, the Ministerial Engagement Partnership is looking an awful lot at how we better engage communities. I think that for a lot of our members has been, and a lot of them obviously would engage with planning consultancies, that's been a work in progress over the last six years. Um, there is good evidence out there, and some of that has been heard at that meetings of that Ministerial Engagement Partnership, but I don't doubt there's a lot of learning to be done about how better to engage with communities going forward. I think there are, and then there, there are equally then smaller elements of it which may need looked at going forward. So for instance, we're aware of, of a few sort of master plans that have been brought forward, particularly for some of the old sort of like army barrack sites. They are obviously very heavily consulted on, but then when you then kind of take forward an individual element of that, uh, there's a further round of consultation. And in some cases, I think that's led to a bit of confusion, particularly among local communities, because they think there's now something new coming forward, when actually it's a cons consultation, it's, it's, it's part of the overall master plan site. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily something new. And then there's questions about why are you consulting this on this again if it's the same thing? Um, you know, so there's some requirements around that at the minute, which I suppose could be looked at. Um, but it will be interesting to see what that Ministry of Engagement Partnership reports. I think it's due in a couple of months' time to go to the Minister. But certainly we find it very interesting so far in terms of understanding where we have done well with community engagement and, and where we are we need to do a lot better okay well, thank you i suppose then just in, in my last point then in relation to covid and, and obviously as you've said there we've had to adapt um fairly quickly one of the things i have have been raising and i know you've said as well that there's a very strong um argument about extending permission for developments which have been held up um from commencing construction over the last year and, and we have raised this with the Minister on timeless occasions now. Um, what has the sector's experience been with this? Is this is something, you know, I think it still should be considered? And if and what do you think would happen if no extension was forthcoming? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of ways I suppose I suppose to look at this at the minute where, 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 where when you get permission, you know, it's it's valid for five years. We 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 obviously have the, 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 the the lag of the, the side effect of the pandemic um, and in terms of projects which would have otherwise moved to construction in the last year or, or may now be subject to delays for different reasons, particularly on the commercial side. I think the other piece that we need to be very mindful of is 
those sites which have approval or are due to get approval in the, in, the, in the coming period of time. But one of the main planning conditions is that you need to be able to connect to a wastewater treatment system. Yeah. And I suspect there'll be quite a lot of that in the system where um, there won't be the ability to connect right now, but there may be in, in several years' time. So it's a fine balance of been extending applications forever in the day, but you know we, we do need to be careful here that we don't start turning down potential investment because of that wastewater treatment issue. You know there, there will be hopefully greater levels of investment in this financial year and the financial years coming forward in terms of rectifying a lot of those issues as well as other things that hopefully Northern Ireland Water are able to do with, with contractors in order to get sites moving that otherwise wouldn't be. Um, so I think there's a couple of things with, with that extending permissions which need to be taken in the pandemic element, but also in that element around uh, the wastewater treatment capacity. Yeah. Okay. Look, thank you very much, David. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Ms Kelly. Uh, thanks very much. And thanks very much for your presentation. There is. Uh, little uh, that I would disagree with, and certainly uh, the issue about consultation fatigue is well made. I know it's a particular issue, uh, and ABC Council have been involved in some recent um, cases there, uh, as well as the delay taken by some of the statutory partners. And but but what what I'm interested in um, is the enforcement section where there was no comment, and. Uh, I know of cases uh, in my own constituency where there is a, a multitude of layers of developers on a particular site. So somebody buys a site, gets plan approval, maybe does a bit of work, or someone else then comes along and they're the developer. And then somebody else comes along to do phase two. And uh, some of the properties haven't been linked to the main sewers and there's not the same statutory authority given to NIW in terms of bonds, etc., to enforce. Um, uh, the work to, to be completed, and then it falls between the two stools about who has enforcement powers, if anyone, between Environmental Health uh, Chair and uh, NIW. So, just wondered if you had any comments to make around uh, enforcement powers that you could be in position now to make to committee. Well, yes, I suppose the, 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 bit, the bit in the section that the response will be left blank wasn't necessarily because we don't believe in enforcement, uh, it was just because. Um, looking at what was currently in the act, I suppose we took the view that it was, it was, it was already there. But yes, the point is well made about whether enforcement is enforced. Uh, I think with regard to some of those, I know when we were last at the committee, we briefly engaged around some of those issues back to the sort of the 2008 recession around unadopted roads and unadopted uh, wastewater systems and, 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 and such like. And I think. You know the, the development industry recognises that, that, and that's the principle of the bond being there. Is that you know you, you have to conduct all best endeavours to make sure that if you're doing a site that the site is completed and that it is an acceptable standard that is signed off by people um, and that people can move into the houses in all good in all good confidence. Um, that that you know I, I think there's been an awful lot of good work done around bonds in that last decade. Um, I mean, the extent to which the bonds are there, um, uh, you know, and there, there are historic issues which are still outstanding, which, you know, we speak to sometimes with Northern Iron Water about with regard, with regard to those. But currently, you know, I think, you know, in terms of how the bonds have been working in the last few years, um, you know, I think they've been working relatively well. And I think our industry is, is, is much better now at making sure that developments are completed and adopted and, and done properly. Um, but it is absolutely vital that that is the case because if we go back to 2008 and a lot of those legacy sites, you know, there are still problems out there. Um, um, and while, yes, a lot of that was because um, a lot of developers went 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 bust. Uh, you know, there's also the issue of making sure that the bond that is taken out for any site is is adequate, so that if something goes wrong, to say in the case of Northern Ireland Water, something like there would be catastrophic failure in the in the wastewater system, the connection system, that there is enough in that bond to make sure that Northern Ireland Water can step in and complete the works if need be. Um, 
I think our sense is that those bonds are now are, are sufficient in order to do that if such things did come to pass. So that the issues that we would have faced sort of ten with the issues that we started to face ten, eleven years ago shouldn't come to pass again. Um, but equally, you know, I think we would sort of engage with our members on the basis that, you know, they are working to deliver good quality housing for for people. Um, and there is a, a social requirement in that too to make sure that they do do best endeavours to make sure that what they develop uh, is at that level. I just wonder in terms of um, a developer being a membership of the Federation, you know, are there standards uh, that they need to comply with? Because there are serial offenders, you know, they open up one company, don't complete a site, open up another company. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to name any, but they, uh, I'm sure other public representatives on the committee face the same problem when making representation on, beha- on behalf of house owners. The house owners don't want us to go to the media, and yet it's the media that would have probably the biggest impact on the developer because they may want to sell their house and are afraid of uh, that having a consequence if we go public, and therefore we have to use whatever channels are available to us in terms of complaints procedures with statutory agencies. But it would be interesting to hear uh, uh, what proactive approach uh, or penalty uh, that the Federation could apply to uh, rent uh, developers? Well, I mean, we're, we're, a, we're a membership organisation, so you know, what, you know, we represent probably most of what you would know as Northern Ireland's major, and the house building side, what you would know as most of Northern Ireland's major, major house builders, most of whom have been around for a number of decades and have very good track records at delivering what they what they do and doing it very well. Uh, we do obviously have standards and codes of conduct within our own membership. Um, um, I, we know we, we 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 stand over those to to the to the to as best we can. Um, but certainly, I, you know, from the years that I have been involved with the federation, I always have a good sense around various membership groups that we have that they do want to do what what they can do in order to grow Northern Ireland's housing stock and make the housing stock fit for purpose and fit for the people that want to to live in it. Um, And look, there will always be issues that will come up going forward, but I I, I, I do think we've we've got past a lot of those that, that certainly happened in that 2008 period for three or four years. Um, I think we've got beyond that, um, but the important thing for, for a lot of those members of ours is to to have a good sense of their medium term in terms of what they're able to develop and, and, and were, and, and that's probably where we are a bit lacking at the minute in terms of how the planning system works on that basis. I may come back to you privately in relation to particular problems, but uh, separate to that, you mentioned also the the local planning, and I know that's a big issue. Uh, I ABC council area is a bit large chunk, if not all of uh, my constituency, and uh, we've had considerable delays in the area plan development, and there is an imbalance between where people want to live and where planners think that they should live, and. Uh, there's also the issue where um, some um, people have gained planning approval but haven't built, but that's having an impact at holding back another scheme, you know, in terms of area plan development. I just wonder, have you had much experience of that elsewhere? And uh, what um, dialogue have you had with planners uh, in relation to how to fix the problem? Yeah, so, I mean, sometimes we can get away. We, we have started got into this discussion around, you know, people who will get permission for a site but not then build it out. Um, I, and, and then uh, quite often, what, I remember there was a consultation a few years ago at the Department of Finance when, when Martin O'Muller was, was the minister, was running around you know, things like land banking and stuff like that, and the consultation kind of fell away and was the collapse of the, with the executive. You know, our view is that our members... I suppose some people would call it would call it land banking, but it's it's more you know planning out how you're going to develop a, a profile of new housing projects. Um, we you know it's in our members' interest in order to be able to complete a site and move on to another one. Um, I don't think, 
Now, and I certainly don't see any evidence that a lot of them are involved in land banking as such, but that they are more involved in planning out their business. And when you are, are working with a planning system on which if you buy a piece of land which is zoned for development and you're doing, you're taking it forward in line with the, with the local planning policies, there's a housing need, um, but equally then you don't really have a strong sense of when you might get permission for it, then you know that can over a period of time build up into certain developers if you look at certain permissions that they would have that you might go, well, goodness me, they've got all these permissions and they haven't built them, or, or they don't seem to be wanting to bring them forward. Um, and I think another thing that needs to be borne in mind right now with a lot of what would be perceived by some as land banking is if one of the main conditions of your permission is that you need to connect to the wastewater treatment system. Well, we know there are north of 160 wastewater treatment sites in Northern Ireland right now that don't have capacity. So there, there are a lot of things to, to, to factor into that discussion. Um, um, but certainly, you know, I, I am having worked with a number of house builders over the years, you know, I don't, I don't see land banking as something that they, they, are, they are actively involved in other than doing it in, in a way which, which suits their business needs. Well, that chair, it's just um, something I'm interested in at a local level, it's something that's cropped up, but um, I presume the market will eventually, people will, uh, I, ju I just think there needs to be sometimes greater flexibility within planning service in terms of the area plan. Uh, you know, if a developer is not in a position to build, then that shouldn't prevent uh, development elsewhere necessarily, if the infrastructure, of course, is there to uh, meet the requirements of the sites. But thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Anderson. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. I couldn't get it on mute. And thank you, David. And notwithstanding what you said to to Dolores there in regards to the code of conduct and the standards, um, as Dolores and, and members of the committee would know. Um, I've been quite focal in Derry with regards to the 222 roads that are unadopted and 12.5 million, that's in Derry and Shaban, our, our, our council district. Now, I find that totally unacceptable. And whatever your fury is about people moving into homes in, in good confidence, I can tell you that across the city, uh, there are people um, who went in to debt and danger to get themselves the home of their dream um, only to be sitting for years waiting on roads to be adopted and sewage to be fixed. It's not acceptable. It's not acceptable anywhere in the north. And, you know, I just want to, to say that to you because I think people listening to you today from Woodland uh, Heights and Muse in the Waterside area and Derry who for 10 years have been trying to get the sewage sorted out and the roads repaired and people moving into homes. They certainly thought they were going to be moving in in good confidence, only uh, to be dealing with the situation. Just as Dolores has said, they don't want uh, the focus and attention, but it was only by putting focus on attention that they get some movement. So there's work to be done, in my opinion, um, at your end. Um, obviously, NA Water... Uh, would have a reason for rejecting maybe applications. You talked about 160 uh, wastewater treatment systems uh, that don't have the capacity. We don't have the capacity here in Derry. We can see developments being stopped as a consequence um, of all of that. And and on the issue, you know, on, on that issue, he says that there should be greater weight uh, given to um, a pre-development inquiry application at the earliest possible stage uh, in the process. Um, but then you would understand then you don't think any water should be given the greater weight uh, in an individual council decision on an application. So could you elaborate on that in the context of what between Dolores, what she has said, what I have said, and I know it's an issue for many mm -hmm. MLAs. And this isn't just about a historical issue. This, no. this is happening here and now. It's happening in developments as they are being developed now. And that's where we need better practices in place. And we need some kind of penalty clause in place so you don't have developers hopping 
from one development uncompleted into another and onto another and leaving a trail of what people who are living with them feel that uh, a trail of frustration and destruction for them and for us then as representatives to have to try to make a case to get them back and that has taken years in many places to be resolved. No, I, I, I totally accept what you said and you're quite right. There, there, that has to be, obviously a lot of it stemmed from what happened after the 2008 recession and there were a number of years, I mean I remember the predecessors of mine were before the old DRD committee about it, I think it was maybe around 2011, 2012. I think where we probably have got to now is making absolutely sure that the bonds that are taken out for any new development are better than they were, that they are sufficient to deal with any issues if there are issues of developers going into administration or going bust. I, I get the, the sense that what in, in and around the, the boom of 2007, 2008, that those bonds weren't of a sufficient enough value that if you were even going to call them in, they wouldn't have got the works up to the required standards. So it's important that those and I do think a lot of work has been done by DFI roads and Northern Ireland Water in recent years to make sure that when new sites are being taken out, when the bonds are being taken out on those sites, that they are at the right level. On the separate PDE piece around Northern Ireland Water, we would very strongly, in the current climate, we would very strongly encourage our, our members at the earliest stage to go down the PDE route with Northern Ireland Water to understand a, if there is capacity, but also through their solutions engineering team, whether there's anything that can be done, say a stormwater offset or something like that, if you know the upgrade to the relevant wastewater treatment works isn't programmed for at least three, four, five years. Is there anything that can be done at the cost of the developer in order to get the development moving. That's something that we're working with Northern Ireland Water on. I, I think, as I said at the committee previously, my recollection is that Braidwater are working quite closely, for instance, with them in Limavati on a particular scheme where they are doing that, um, and we'll see how that works out. But the one caveat that we have to that is we kind of have got the sense from Northern Ireland Water that although we agree with them on, on making a PDE something that developers should absolutely go for and try to understand what's in the system and what their capacity is. Equally, we don't want to find out where we then go down the route where if there is no capacity, Northern Ireland Water can say very clearly that the application should be rejected. I, I, I think that is for us going too far the other way because that doesn't seem to take into account well, you know, if the permission is valid for five years, for instance, is it likely that the most nearest wastewater treatment work system could be upgraded in those five years? If you're talking about just refusing it on the basis of what is available today, that could stop an awful lot of applications, which could otherwise be viable in several years' time, or could be viable through changes in how you can bring forward solutions engineering to different projects. So there's just that little little tweak around we understand the importance of a PDE. Uh, equally, the other issue that an awful lot of our members say is that where they do go down the PDE route with Northern Ireland Water, because it's basically a first-come, first-served system, they get the PDE, they're told there is capacity, they then enter into the planning process. By the time they get to the end of the planning process, that capacity is gone. Because the PDE is looking at the wastewater treatment capacity availability at that point in time, not at the point two years down the line when other applications may have been approved and they have taken up that capacity. So that, that that's an issue there around you know understanding the the fullness of what Northern Ireland Water are having to consider when they're when developers are putting in PDEs at a very early stage. So while we see the importance of them, there's probably little bits of them which we would like to see tweaked. You know, but certainly going down the route of if there's no available capacity and there's no solutions engineering that could be done to an application, then we just flat refuse it. I think that probably would be going too far as far as we're concerned. Mm, just listening to you, it's probably about conditionality and, and forecast uh, as opposed to just looking at it in the here and now and looking at if there's potential for improving going forward. 
Um, and I think that's something that the committee could could take in, take account of. In in your brief, can I can I ask you? You stated that there should be statutory timeframes introduced for statutory consultees, and I know you talked about some of that. Uh, just to respond to to major and regular significant applications, and response times has been indicated to be to be problematic uh, in the past. So, can you comment on the scale of the problem? Um, uh, in the sector and the impact on the sector. Yes. Yeah, so where, where, where we have had, you know, from from most of our friendly really major major application, we have that three to four week time frame where it is expected that the consultee will give a substantive response. I mean, I'm sure there are instances where it has happened, but I, I think broadly speaking, the vast majority of our members would take the view that that that, that time frame just doesn't happen in the real world. Now. I think one of the things that we've kind of said is if, if you're entering in for major applications at the pad stage and you're having a more detailed conversation with the planning authority but all the statutory consultees early on in the process, then you can have a better discussion around, as I was saying to one of, one of your committee colleagues, you know, a 50-unit housing application in Derry, depending on where it is, may not be necessarily the same as a 50-unit application in Bangor because of where the land is, issues and um, issues in relation to that. So in those instances, a statutory consultee may quite understandably require a bit more time than three to four weeks to put in a substantive response. That could then be something that could probably be looked at in a, in a processing agreement, where very early on you're, you're, you're all, and this is it's important for our members too, you know, so that there's things like application checklists there so that they know what they need to do and when because it can't just be all us saying, oh, the statutory consultees didn't do this or they didn't do that. There's an obligation on us as well to make sure we're presenting the right information and in a timely manner. And I think that piece around pad processing agreements, I think that would help a lot. We do get very fixated on the time scales, yes, but if there was more certainty in the process, as I said, pretty much anybody I speak to who wants to bring forward a major application anywhere in the, in the 11 council areas, if you were to ask them what is their time frame broadly from when they submit their planning application, I, I, I think we're now at a stage where they probably wouldn't even give you a, a, a time frame back. Right. They'd probably tell you at least a year, but that would be... That's about as much as they would say. Well, and David, that, 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 the outline there seems reasonable. Uh, and again, I think that's um, that's a process and what you've talked about there, um, we need to give due regard to that uh, going forward because that's very reasonable. Just finally, Chair, because I know you're up against it for time, yeah. you did state that some of your members have had to submit new planning applications for already approved developments uh, when they're seeking some kind of minor amendments or non-material changes. And I was surprised to hear that they had to submit new. So, uh, and you call this an unnecessary restraint on the development. Now that's if it's quite minor or non-material changes. So could you elaborate on that a bit? And I'm just conscious that the chair is up against time. Sure, so, so the, the main thing there would be things like change of house types, uh, three bed, you know, four bed to three bed, three bed to four bed, uh, and, and, and several of the houses in, in, a, in, a, in a stage of a development. That that kind of thing. Uh, not every council. It's a bit of a bit of a. It's a bit all over the place, to be honest with you. But um, knowing, having a much clearer definition of w what everybody understands to be a material change, uh, and what everybody understands to be minor amendments. I think other jurisdictions. Britain, the South, they're better, they're better at that than we are. I, I certainly know of several of our members, you know, who, you know, they wanted to change two houses in a, in a substantial development. They wanted to change them from four beds into three beds um, to allow more space, you know, for sort of the family living on the ground floor, and they had to resubmit a new planning application. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thank I, 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 you. Okay. okay. Thank no, thank you for that. Look, I'm just conscious that chair we've probably gone over time or whatever. But David, look, it's been fascinating listening to you, and I really enjoyed it in terms of some of the other comments that you made as well, because I've learned a lot. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And yes, we have run over time, but if I can bring Mr. Beggs in um, briefly.
Why we can't hear you at all? I'm sorry. All right, my my mistake. Okay. And the, your your request to uh, reduce the uh, the community planning consultation, pre planning consultation from twelve to eight weeks. That's about reducing the planning time overall by a month, I, I take it. But my my, my question would be you know, uh, around the use of uh, modern technology to consult, um, which has had to occur over this past year. What has been the degree of engagement with that pre-planning consultation online? So our understanding of it is is that uh, it. it where you have the where you've had the public event historically, there there's almost this kind of you know this, the room that you walk into, you see the boards, and you may be asked to make a few comments on, on the way out. Um, I, that probably has led to some good level of feedback and engagement after events, but it probably could be built and it probably should be bulked out. And that, that's where we think online and remote over the last year has helped a lot because people are able to attend events, they're able to watch webinars, they're able to download the information, they're able to have it sent to their houses. I think it's, I think it's a better way of engaging people and, and it, well, it's a better way of complementary engagement. You know, that you wouldn't get rid of the public event, you would probably do all of it as a means to engage because we understand that there are different communities out there who like to engage in different way, you know, younger people, older people, whatever. Um, I think it's a better way of making sure that everybody has time to look. I think there's, I think maybe there has been a sense going back that if you're asked to go to a public event at 10 o'clock on a, on a Tuesday or something like that, uh, that's your opportunity to comment and, and that's it. Uh, whereas when you have the online and remote and you have it available for say an eight to ten week you know period of time for people to have comments on then that is a better way to get more of a widespread amount of comments in and certainly from our members who have had to engage like that over the last year because of the pandemic i think the sense is that that it has actually led to a better level of community engagement and that's something which has come up several times in that ministerial engagement partnership on PAC already. Uh, it's a comment that has come up a lot from community groups who have been involved with that, is that it, it's been a welcome change over the last year. And finally then, Ryan, wastewater treatment. Um, the, the absence of the ability to, to link into sewage systems, is that making a bit of a nonsense of the area plans? Because in some areas, um, houses will not be able to be delivered. And secondly, in terms of the um, legacy of 2008 and and the absence of sewers and or sewage systems in some areas um, has that been because uh, an absence of bonds or because the bonds being set at, at the inadequate level? Well, on the latter point, I, I think as, as you look back historically, it probably is is that the bonds weren't at the right level. I, I think that 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 seems that seems to be pretty recurrent thing. Um, whereas now, um, you, you probably would have some of our members saying that the bonds they're required to take out are too high, but that's in the context of what happened from the 2008 recession, where the bonds are obviously probably understandably higher. Um, on then, uh, what was the previous question? Sorry, Mr. Beggs. The, 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 the inability to link to sewage networks is that going to? In, I think that will inhibit the area plans from being delivered. So it makes a nonsense of the whole planning process. Yeah, well, one of the issues there when we, when we when we talked about joined up government, you know, uh, the the local plans, the local development plans, the elements of them that have come forward, some of them have referred to the wastewater issues, um, but they've kind of you know it said it's a Northern Ireland waters issue. Um, that you know, so you can have as a big a housing number as you want in your local area, but if you have capacity constraints, I mean, we know we know that there are a number of areas right now where there are people trying to put in you know pre-development inquiries and being told there is just no capacity, there is no, there's nothing to connect to. Uh, Northern Ireland Water will go down the process of looking at individual sites. Uh, and seeing if there is an engineering solution that you can bring forward, like stormwater offset, for instance, but that will only deal with a small handful of applications where there are capacity issues. Um, the big thing we need is we need that level of investment into into Northern Ireland water. 
to be roughly double where we were in the last financial year, and we need that to remain at that level for at least six consecutive financial years. And even if we do that, we'll probably only fix about half of the current issues. And that's that's where we are, at, you know. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, David, for your presentation and for, for taking so many questions. Um, we very much appreciate and that will certainly um, inform our deliberations as we move forward through this and obviously whenever we meet with officials um, with regard to this issue. So thank you for your time this morning. Thank okay. you. Okay, moving members then for, to the forward um, work programme at item 10, just draw your attention to that at page 144. Members content? Yes. Okay. Yep. Moving then to item 11, any other business? Chair, could, I just wonder, could sure. I ask, um, we, we were given notice of the transfer, you know, about the Reservoir Act. I just wonder, you know, that it hasn't come up on the business committee timetable, if we might find out where it's at, okay. if it was presented to the TEO and when it was presented. Absolutely, we'll pursue that. Mm -hmm. Any members, any other business? Ms Kimmins? Thanks, Chair. Chair, it's just in relation to an issue. I'd raised it directly with the Minister um, regarding a call from, it was Newry Bid and Lisburn City Council in relation to on-street parking. Um, and they had said that they'd asked for consideration for one hour free parking and, and um, you know some changes in, in terms of that. Now, they'd asked for the Minister to engage with them. She had come back to me to say officials had engaged with them, but um, from what I, I'm being told, it's it hasn't happened. I think it's happened some time ago, not um, since this has been raised. So, I mean, they, they still have quite a number of issues, and um, particularly in your area. I suppose I can speak from my own area probably in more detail, but in terms of nearly over enforcement um, and all of that, and I was wondering if maybe we could look at inviting them to committee um, to, to hear what their concerns are. Is there a way of, of helping them to uh, move forward, particularly as we're coming out of COVID and we want to try and help businesses? Um, to get through this um, and help them to, to get back to a better baseline. So we just wanted to put that request forward. Okay, could, could I maybe suggest that maybe that they write to the committee just outlining their concerns and that might be something then that the committee then can forward on to the department and if we feel that it's useful to have a presentation with regards to that then we can make uh, a call on that at that stage. Would that be useful? Yeah, that, that's fair enough. I can go back with that one. Thank you, Chair. Okay, any other items members wish to raise? No, okay, thank you. Moving then to um, item 12. Our next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. Wednesday the 12th of May in the Senate Chamber, um, Parliament Buildings. Um, and can I advise all those who are in the room just to maintain social distancing. Um, can I thank all members for their engagement um, this morning. The meeting's now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber.